has returned from executive session. Uh, informational reports, we'll start with uh, Superintendent Jay. Madam President, members of the board and guests, um, <clears throat> I want to first start by pointing out that today is Administrative Assistance oh Day. <laughs> and I just want to share that um, I am very grateful to have an amazing administrative assistant with Krista. And she has made the job uh, much easier for me. Um, she's done a lot of training, uh, training me on how to do things. But um, we have a great relationship working, and she does a great job. So I just wanted to first give her these flowers and this card and say thank you. So. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right, uh, a couple other things, just one, oh, I lost, did I lose it? Okay, let's see if it comes back. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the playground equipment. Um, just, I want to give you an update, just some, some comments on that. Um, first of all, we're, we're finalizing some things. We've had a committee of students, uh, parents, staff, lots of feedback on this. Um, and, and it's really important to me we get this right because I really feel there's got to be an importance on play. Um, the last couple of years have been rough on kids, and to have a, a great facility for our kids to play before school at lunch recess, second recess, um, we're looking at opening it up on weekends to, to families and just do more engagement with the community. So we really want to get this right and put an emphasis on imaginative play, put your phones down, put technology away, in play but in order to do that we have to obviously have some pretty cool equipment and um and go through that so i just want to share it's very costly <laughs> um up front it, it's i've been working on this non-stop uh for about a month um and we've looked at a lot of different options um and we've landed on a few uh we've got them approved by the the trust so that the insurance is covered on those um, we're looking at pieces um, from two different installers because we didn't find exactly what we want in one. So we're looking at two different uh, companies coming in to put things in. Um, they're both on co-op, so uh, it makes it a little bit easier for us to work through. Um, the sponge flooring and installation is where a lot of the cost is on this, this equipment. And being that it's going to be in the courtyard, we've looked at a variety of different types of soft play, you know, of what's available for when the kids do fall off of it and the sponge the the, the pour and play sponge is the best option for us in that environment um, we are looking at uh, the possibility of 500 kids at one time out there at the playgrounds in the morning because we're k5 now it's a big difference from being a k3 uh, so we have to be able to have places for all these kids to go when we do have that play time and so we need multiple pieces of equipment so I just wanted to um, kind of review that. Uh, we do want to get this right. Um, we're spending a lot of money on this, so we want it to last, and we want things that really bring out imagination in the kids um, as far as what they can do. Um, if we get very, very basic equipment, I, I think the, the, the longevity of it's not going to be there. So we've looked at some new innovative things. Um, I went to a few parks and actually um, – Mr. Alexander sent me to a few in Mesa that he really liked. He's got young kids. Um, I've visited them. I've seen the equipment up, up you know, in, in person. And we're getting really close to, um, to finding, finalizing that. Uh, the second part of the playgrounds is going to be the outdoor sports facility. So right now we have the uh, three basketball courts. And we're looking at um, converting those with some sport court covering to make one basketball uh, one, uh, putting in some turf so they could play football and soccer. And then the third one, we're looking at putting in a sport court that is hockey so they can play floor hockey. And also uh, futsal is another opportunity that they can do with that. So we thought our fourth and fifth graders might have more use for the, the, the big space, that 12,000 square foot space. 
So we want to get that right as well and make that really, really nice. Um, like I said, all the, all the equipment we're going to buy is approved by the trust. I should have uh, some final um, things for you to review soon. Um, we're just waiting on the quotes to, to all come in. A second piece of what we want to do is to put in an indoor playground in one of the team rooms because um, there's, we just think it's, it's a great idea for one of those large spaces. Um, it will actually be cheaper for us to do an indoor playground than to theme out another whole room at 3,600 square feet. So we've been working with the trust on approving um, an indoor playground system. Um, when speaking with staff, this is one of the number one things that they wanted for the new school was this indoor space because they want it for obviously hot days in the summer when we're first coming back to school, rain days, um, uh, an alternative place to take kids for maybe PBIS. Um, with us being under construction to start the year over there, this would give us an immediate playground while the other playgrounds are being um, constructed because the lead time on this is only about two weeks. So uh, once we get all these things procured and approved, we could um, have an indoor playground installed prior to August 3rd, which can house up to 150 kids at one time. So that'd be two grade levels at a time, which is what we uh, figure to be a typical lunch session. Uh, we also worked with our OT and PT uh, teachers and they feel that they could use this indoor playground for their services as well, which we thought added another benefit to having it um, on campus. So remember the team room is about similar to the size of this room. Uh, there, there's three of them, they're very large. Um, and so to have an air conditioned indoor space would be a really cool thing. It's something that other schools don't have that we would be able to market as well. Uh, we're also looking at adding into that the Lou Interactive system. This is an interactive um, projector system where the kids can play games by just projecting a virtual screen onto a wall. They throw balls at it, they go up and touch it. Um, this is a much smaller cost than playground equipment, um, but it will bring in a, a kind of a, a cool um, new style of play with updated games that come out every year and new things for the kids to do. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at with playgrounds. Uh, I'll be bringing to you more information, but I just want to, to get it out there that um, this will be a large cost of our total budget. We'll go to playgrounds uh, to get that done. Uh, testing is complete. Uh, for the most part, we have some, some students who were absent uh, that are making up uh, testing, but for the most part, it's complete. We had a very successful testing uh, season, no real tech issues. Um, Mr. Alexander oversees that. He did a good job of getting everybody uh, set up and ready to go. Um, and most sites were clearly over the 95%. So we'll have no issue meeting our goals there. Um, the kids, to my understanding, hearing from principals, uh, worked hard, took it seriously. We'll see where we're at. This will be our first real um, place to start with academic achievement and grow from there. Um, we're, we're currently still hiring. Our hiring has been very strong uh, this, this spring. I'm very excited about the people we've been able to hire. We've hired lots of positions uh, since uh, February. Uh, recently, we just hired a preschool teacher, so we, um, because we're gonna need a fourth one now with Little Falcons growing and hopefully growing more over the summer. Um, that has now pushed us to uh, have a need. We're gonna have a need in first grade. We still have a need in fifth grade. Um, but we're doing interviews right now, and the pool is looking good uh, as far as to hire those. Where we're going to need to hope for a little bit of help here is at the high school level um, because we have positions in the three hardest places to find. <laughs> uh, math, science, and Spanish are three areas that we need to hire for. So we are advertising um, some of the perks that we have in our district to teachers and hope that we'll get some more applicants. And then we're also going to have several special ed positions as is the rest of the state. And I am concerned that those will be very, very, very hard to fill. Um, if we cannot fill them, then we would move to um, using contracted services for those positions. So with that, I conclude my comments. Board reports. We'll start with Ms. Reed. Um, I was able to read to the preschool last or the week before last and I was really impressed with our little preschoolers. They sat and listened so well. 
Um, I had went to coffee with Kevin, uh, where Sean Uphoff was there representing the coalition, and I was really impressed with a lot of what they're looking to do for our elementary school, as well as um, the PTO and the mentors. I, I see them in there a lot. Um, the kids and I helped out at the PBIS store, and one thing that I've found really encouraging is that the creative items actually go quickly, like the most quickly, like the crayons and the markers and, and things like that. Um, I've also been really impressed with our teachers because more often than not, the classes are really well behaved, which that space is not necessarily encouraging them to sit quietly. It's full of toys, um, and they sit so well, and I, that says a lot about our teachers. Um, and then I was also uh, able to share some things at a, a meeting when I was approached by a lot of community members afterwards just looking to get involved and to help out at our district, volunteer, and, and look for ways to, to be involved. Um, and then I listened to the Coffee with Kane. I love that you went to the Fort McDowell Library. I thought that that was very proactive. We live in a busy world, and I think that convenience is important, which is another reason why I love the virtual option as well. So that's it for me. So I attended the National Honor Society event for our high schoolers, and it was pretty cool to watch the kids and their parents and the excitement that they had. And just a big congratulations to those kids that have made that honor society. Um, I also happened to watch the stellar student recognition at the town council. And it's interesting to see the different dynamics, right? So when the kids get to go to the town council meeting, they're even more excited to stand up there and have their picture taken. And we had a couple uh, high schoolers with a whole bunch of little kids, and it was just, it was super sweet. Um, and then I attended a Title IX Changes seminar. So that's all I have. Ms. Um, I did attend the, um, the Coffee with Kane in Fort McDowell, which was really interesting to see. That's the first time I've had a chance to go out there. I, had, I went to the coffee with uh, Mr. Hartman as well, which was always good listening to all the comments by the parents. I attended the NHS induction, and I, I, I did that. I, I wanted to see it, but I had been in charge of that when I taught, so it was really nice seeing it all over again and the number of students they got in there. It, it, I told the parents and the students that they should be proud because I know it, what it entails. And I did go to the elementary school to the uh, preschool science night, which was really adorable. It was like several sections and the kids were all going there and their little brothers and sisters were jumping in also trying to do everything so it, it was really rewarding to watch between the high school and the, pre, the elementary preschool. Mr. Just to uh, remind you that all of you I think hopefully got an invitation to the commencement at uh, EVID yeah. um, for 15th and 16th. You can mm -hmm. go to either one um, so I encourage you to go. My class is graduating on the 16th, so 16th? that would be my suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I attended the last, uh, well, not the last two, but I attended a couple of the baseball games. Um, I was there for senior night, and that was really exciting because I've known a lot of those seniors since they were like in kindergarten. Uh, so that was fun to see, and they won, uh, which was just an amazing, you know, it was an amazing game. Um, and then uh, they're they're actually made it to the playoffs, so they're going to play uh, May second is their first game. So I encourage you all to come out and support the Falcon baseball team. Um, and then uh, I just also wanted to wish uh, Krista a happy Admin Day. Uh, Krista is the board admin as well. She is our board secretary. She's actually the only other employee that the board works closely with. So thank you for all of you do uh, all you do for the board. Pleasure to work with everyone. <laughs> and then uh, prior to our meeting, the board had an, uh, another training session from ASBA regarding roles and responsibilities, so we're always continuing to learn uh, how to work together as a board and, and what our roles are and uh, how we stay in check with open meeting law and things like that, so I'd like to thank ASBA for coming out and doing that. And then last but not least, I wanted to remind you all that tomorrow night at McDowell Mountain is the STEAM night from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, that the, they'll be putting on, uh, a, I guess, a class or um, an open event, it says, for students and families at no cost. So that's that.
So moving on, um, Christy, do we have any public comments? Information discussion items. Uh, we have a whole laundry list of housekeeping items. Uh, I'll just read them and then if there's anything, the board, receive, the board receive them all in your packet. If there are certain ones you'd like to discuss, some of them are just very basic and self-explanatory, but once I read them all, then we can go back. Uh, so the annual housekeeping items include appointing representative to the Arizona School Risk Retention Trust, authorization to suspend, auxiliary operations fund, certified evaluators, authorized signers, hearing officers, investment of debt service funds, out of district placement, sole source providers, student activity treasurer, summer contract issuance, and voucher signing. Uh, these are just information discussion. They'll be on the agenda at our next meeting for voting. So um, does anyone have any questions regarding appointing the representative to the Arizona School Re Retention Trust? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on uh, to the authorization to suspend. No questions or comments? Moving on uh, to the Auxiliary Operations Fund. Any questions or comments? I, um, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, for this one I just uh, wanted to make sure that we're gonna be getting supporting documents for the spending before we do these things, before you prevent. What do you mean, supporting documents? Like we talked, about having, we talked about having some supporting documents for the expenditures as well as um, maybe having meetings with Tyler. I just think something like that would be good before we approve and... Yeah, this is just um, basically just a statute stating that all of our operation monies will be deposited after, the, we, after we approve them. So, um, yeah, it doesn't change anything of how we do it and including the information that we Okay, yeah, I just mean when we approve it, moving forward, we'll have the supporting documents or that meeting prior to our board meeting where we okay. just, okay. Any other questions? Did you have a question, So I just want to clarify, because we're typically not given documentation with the auxiliary funds. And Madison's question was, we will, and your response was yes. So we asked for Tyler to give us more information. So, um yeah, this isn't this isn't approving um, to do, to do anything other than stating that the money gets deposited after we approve those reports. So it's just it's just a housekeeping item. If there's information we, from the auxiliary fund that we should that you want to see, then yes, we need to request that from Tyler. So where did this? Why is this resolution coming about currently? Is it something that's always been done annually or is this a new one no this is an annual okay. housekeeping thank item. you yeah. everything here um, that you see here none of it is new it was passed on to me from the prior um, executive assistant okay. I, I honestly don't know a lot about them other than <laughs> we've just approved them or brought them before the board every year so. thank you it's a new governing board so each year we just we redo them Thank you. Okay. Um, next up is uh, certified evaluators. Are there any questions regarding the certified evaluators? Okay. Hearing none, uh, we'll move on to authorized signers. Um, these are authorized check signers. Uh, basically, it's our admin. Um, so it basically states that Dr. J, uh, Mr. Alexander, Karen Popowitz um, can be check signers on the m and revolving account, the food services, employee benefit insurance trust, flex medical, employee insurance programs withholding, employee benefits insurance trust for dental, state payroll taxes, and federal payroll taxes. Uh, at the site levels, Mr. Hartman, Ms. Ms. Kane, Dr. Wheeldryer, and um, uh, Ms. Fernandez, can sign for the high school auxiliary operations student activities accounts and the middle school auxiliary operations student activity accounts. Are there any questions on those? Are they bonded? Dr. J, do you know that? I do not know that. I'd have to get clarification. Alicia, do you know that? If the check signers are bonded. Can someone get back? 
ask Jeff on that question. Well, Jeremy's here. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, are they usually bonded? <laughs> Next up are, is the list of hearing officers uh, that FHUSD would use in the event that we had to have a hearing. Um, are there any questions regarding these five hearing officers? Okay, hearing none. Uh, next up is the investment of debt service funds. Um, again, it's just a resolution uh, that we give the authorization to the county treasurer to invest and reinvest all monies belonging to the district as a debt service fund and purchase securities on its behalf. Any questions? Hearing none. Out of district placement, uh, basically states that um, the superintendent or the director of special ed um, have, the author have the authority to place uh, students in out of district placement when deemed necessary and appropriate for special needs. Are there questions on that? In terms of the budget, um, that's been a problem in the past, a huge yep. problem actually mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, how do we address that? So it has been, and we are adding for next year a self-contained K-5 program to try to limit that cost and bring students back to us that we didn't have the services for in the past. Um, we're close to finalizing um, a hire for that, and then it'll be a new program mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, at the upper levels, it just comes down to the fact of whether we can sustain a program or not. You know, um, if we can't, then we have to use an outside placement. But I've tried to reduce those costs in this first year um, by working with Leah a lot on this and then working with my team on creating this new program to try to bring back several kids. And just the, the cost savings of bringing them back will hopefully we can come close to breaking even on it and then hopefully, you know, save money moving forward. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? So I believe that we're, you would ask for a presentation on special ed in the future. Is that correct? Preschool. Specific Just preschool. preschool. So I'm hoping at some point we can get um, a number of how many children are currently placed out of our district and then what those transition plans are in bringing them back and kind sure. of like when the last staff member was that went and visited them or an IEP was completed to ensure that, you know, those self-contained programs are gonna mm -hmm. work for each of them. Um, and then my preference, um, just because, you know, it's a large financial impact on the district is that, um, those authorizations are only given to you at this point. Um, that would be my preference versus having um, two people on the list. Well, we don't, I mean, we work together on everything. I mean, we're not, I'm not gonna make a decision on special ed without consulting with her. She's not gonna make a decision without consulting with me. Right, but I would prefer that you would have that final and sole authorization rather than having two people listed. All right. The only question I had regarding this kind of goes along with what Libby said. How many students are we unable to serve locally? Like, do we have a number? I, we, we do. I don't, I don't have it with me here, but I've looked it over. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not a huge, huge number, but, I mean, it's, it's quite costly. And um, when you have a student who... Needs can't be met here. Um, we have to find a way to help them, and so it gets it gets expensive when you use outside placement. Mm -hmm. So we we you know we do everything we can to help a student here. We go through every process, um, and then ultimately, when you know the IP team makes that decision, not an individual person, and then you know once that IP team makes that decision, then I work with her on you know which which companies we have available, which is a good fit. We do tours with the family, make sure it's a good fit. Um, you know, sometimes that maybe we, we don't have any other options, so that has to be the placement, and sometimes that can be a little hard for someone to accept, but ultimately it's in the best interest of the kid. So 
was one of the first things I looked at when I came is how, many, how much money are we spending on outside placement and can we reduce that cost? And we've been working on that all year. That's why, you know, we're at this point, we have the position almost hired and um, we have the new room already ready to go at the new school. We'll have it ready to go this summer, but we have it picked out. Um, and we're, we visited, Chris and I visited some campuses that have self-contained at the elementary to see what models were out there and we kind of landed on on one that we liked and so we're working with whoever that new teacher is and then with our um, you know cabinet team to, to finalize it okay. and then as far as the program uh, continue like moving forward do we have enough students to because students that are enrollment and funding go hand in hand so is it funding that we're worried about enrollment both like, do we have enough students to, that we need? Well, to it's hard to predict the at, the, at the elementary what that enrollment will be. I mean, you can get an idea with some of the kids you have in the system now, but kids coming up that are, you know, before we can take them in preschool or before they're identified, might we may have to monitor and adjust as we go. But a teacher like that could easily be reabsorbed into a um, just a regular resource classroom as well because, you know, they have this certification to do both. And there's always a need for resource teachers because I like I said I'd be surprised if we hire every position we have available I'd be shocked I just don't see it happening okay thank you and preschool and special ed preschool are on for May that we'll be talking about okay great uh, next up is the sole source vendors um, a sole source provider is one that alone fulfills the district's need for a particular product part or service they provide a unique product or offer a one-of-a-kind service and then we have the list there. Are there any questions regarding the sole source providers? Can I just make a comment? That's it. We worked really hard to get that number down. Um, I just want to point that out that we, uh, we worked really hard with our finance team and um, our district staff to make sure that ones that shouldn't be on there are not on there and ones that are on there should be on there. And so um, I'm just really happy that our team really went after this to make sure we got this this correct to the best of my knowledge thank you are there other questions I, comments i have a couple we are getting rid of panorama is that correct or no is that the one that we're yes we're on the we already line. did yeah so we're, we're, we're already right. done okay it's already expired so can we mark them off of the sole source provider list for the board approval meeting yeah before we approve it and then uh, before we approve it, is there also a way to get, since some of these were put in place before I was here, supporting documents, even just like a summary or whatever was presented originally? Sure. Okay, thank you. You're sure we're done with Panorama? Yeah, expired. Okay. Yay. Can, like they asked, can we remove that? Is it, are we not using them anymore? I don't plan to. Okay. Well, right, Chris, it's expired. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then let's remove them. From That's fine. And then I have some questions on a couple of the other sole source providers, one of them being Renaissance Learning. Which programs within Renaissance are we currently using? Do you know? I would have to look into it. I, nothing I've brought to us. It's probably something that we still currently use, so I can get that to you, but it's nothing that I've brought that I'm aware of. I have significant concerns regarding Renaissance Learning, and I'm happy to email them to Krista and she can share them with the board, or I can share some of them publicly now, which I'm not certain you probably want me to do. Well, I just want to clarify that these are who our current sole source providers are. Not, it's not that we're adding new ones, we're just publicly stating that these are people we work with in a sole source environment, and if we're under contract or we're in an agreement with them, we need to keep those on the list until we sever our agreement like we did with Panorama. So I would say email that to her and we'll look into it. Yeah, she can email it to the board. Thank you. Um, can you also let us know which programs are actually being used? Like yeah, what she, we use them yes, for? yes. Can, yeah. thank you. And then also the Success Maker online learning tool. Um, it would be nice to know what that is being used for because it seems to have overlapping items with renaissance learning okay and then is on some of these we don't even have an amount that we're spending on them on an annual basis um, 
for example, next Diva, it would be nice to have what that costs per year, as well as the other ones that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And if there are companies on here that we're in a contract with but we're not actually using, if you could let us know that as well. Okay. Like when their contract expires. Okay. Um, next up is the student activity treasurer. Um, this basically gives um, uh, nominates Dr. J as the student. Uh, as the student activities director, or I'm sorry, the student activity treasurer for July 1st, 23 through June 30th of 24. Uh, it also appoints Lisa Cartagini, Michelle Mount, Smout, Kathy Cook, Nancy Knox, and Valerie Fernandez as assistant student activity treasurers. Uh, though they are all at different sites. Are there any questions regarding that? Hearing none. We'll move on. Uh, summer contract issuance. This basically gives Dr. J authorization to issue contracts to any new employees uh, between June 29th and August 8th. That's typically done because the board does not meet, and so uh, it just gives him the authority to do that until the board comes back in session to approve the payroll or the personnel report. Are there any questions regarding that? Okay. Our, sorry, I do have a question. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out how I need to word it. Um, these certified contracts would already be positions that we will have approved in our budget for next year, or would they be positions that we have not approved in our budget? They would be the ones already in the budget. When like we brought, the math. like when we, yeah, okay. the math teacher in July, yep. right? The board wouldn't be able to approve that within the time period, Correct. so it just gives them that. I just wanted to make sure we weren't giving authorization to add additional positions outside. No, and it's nothing that um, there are no new positions that the board hasn't approved a um, job description for either. So there's no positions right. can be hired. But let me let me clarify. So if we have more enrollment than we d we need, or sorry, we have more enrollment than we have staffing for, then I would need to then hire like for that. A first grade teacher. But that would not have been in our budget. So I just want to clarify that I'm not getting that wrong. So if we need to get clarification from Dave, we can do that. But there is a possibility that during the summer I may need to hire positions that are not in the budget based on enrollment if it does go up. So I'd like to get clarification on that because I don't want to be doing something wrong here. But we will have needs that arise with schedules being completed and um, making this all fit together over the summer. So I, I'd like to get clarification, Krista, from Dave on that. The good is if you've got more enrollment than you plan, you also have more revenue. Well, I, I understand that, but I don't want it to come back that sure, I'm uh, not, it. yeah, that I'm hiring without getting it authorized. So I just want to be clear that we get that right. Last housekeeping item is the voucher signing. Uh, it allows voucher signings between meetings during the 23 to 24 school year. So again, you know, the board only meets twice a month, so if something needs signed uh, between those meetings, it allows the business office to release uh, the warrants to vendors as soon as they are ready rather than having to wait for a couple of board meetings. Question? My only statement would be the background. We and I'm sorry, Krista, I might not have sent this one to you. Under the background, it should read 2023 to 2024 school year. Okay. Uh, next up is the governing board meetings for um, July 23 to all the way through June of 24. I had sent an email. Uh, looking to possibly change. We, right now the board meets the second and fourth Wednesdays, that, that it may be beneficial for the board to meet the first and third Wednesdays, just because, as you see on the one uh, proposed meeting calendar, there's a lot of uh, meetings that have to be changed due to holidays, spring break, things like that. So are there questions or comments regarding the two proposals? 
I do prefer the first one because it seems to have a lot less uh, conflicts in some of my holidays as well, so it's better. First and third. The first and third is the first one in the packet, yes. Madison, do you have any questions or comments? No. no. Mm -hmm. Ditto. All right. So um, the board will vote uh, at our next meeting on this, but. You're adding more meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Look, sometimes there's a we lot to talk them. about. <laughs> I know. Would you rather than be put in just on a whim? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like that they're planned. I agree. <laughs> Although I'm not going to be here on October 4th, so we're going to get out there. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I, I just think it's more beneficial. Um, it, it creates a better schedule, and then we're not moving meetings around. And um, just seems like with the other schedule, there's at least well, there's one, two, three, four, at least four that have to be moved. So. And the only clarification again is that the on the first and third Wednesdays of the May fifteenth would be at five as well. The first and third, so the... There's the just not a time listed next to the May 15th right. meeting. The right. rest of them all have times. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so the work study sessions are always at 5. Um, the time for the regular business meetings is usually 6, unless we have the executive session. And the board retreat at 4. As well. All right, hearing no more... Do I not have... You do. Okay. You do. Uh, next up is an overnight, over 100 miles field trip for the girls' volleyball. As Krista pointed out, uh, this is a different trip than the one that came before the board for discussion at our last meeting. Uh, so this will be an additional one. Are there any questions or comments regarding the girls' volleyball trip? Okay. Um, I think it'll be great for them to go to Sholo in June. What a nice place to go when it's so hot here. So, and again, I appreciate that the volleyball coach sent her whole packet because I think that we have to I appreciate that. Okay, next up is the job, job description for the board certified behavioral specialist. Uh, Dr. Jane, I'll let you speak to that, please. Yeah, Madam President, members of the board and guests. Um, We've seen an increase in the need for additional support with student behaviors and um, having someone who has qualifications and the degrees to go with that. Um, we brought somebody in this year to, um, to assist with that and um, we'd like to make that a, try to make that a position moving forward. Um, so as we need the, the additional assistance with that, we have someone who is certified and has the experience and the credentials to address those issues. Um, the teachers have been very, very um, supportive of this and would like to see it continue. Other questions or comments regarding the job description? Do we have the original <laughs> job district description for that, that is a new one. This is a new one. So even though she's currently been working, she has not had a job description? It's been a contracted employee. Okay. And that was to meet the needs of the kids early in the year, and it's been a just a huge success if you talk with the staff and the administration at McDowell Mountain. And then will, are there grants that we will be utilizing to pay for this? Position. I'm going to defer to my grant specialist. <laughs> um, I am working on it. Yeah, we've, we've put a, a, a lot of different um, like scenarios in play, and we're just kind of shuffling things. And yes, I, I, I don't have a specific answer for you yet because we're it's still a, 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 a wheel that is just like spinning and spinning and spinning. So, um, so just if we do use grant funding to make sure we if needed, change the job description so we're falling within those guidelines. Okay, I will be doing that, yeah. For the contract employee that we have that has been doing this job, were we using ESSER funds for that? Where did those funds come from? We repurposed money from a position that we 
had a resignation earlier in the year. Are there other questions regarding the job description? Uh, moving on to the election. Uh, the board <clears throat> has before it uh, information regarding the parcels of land, Four Peaks Building, McDowell Mountain Building, Override, and Bond. As I stated um, earlier, this uh, has to be voted on at our May 9th meeting, so this will be our last real big discussion about it. I mean, we certainly can ask questions at the next meeting as well, but if there's anything that you want to know or have opinions on, like now is the time to, to put it up. So, uh, Dr. J, do you wanna kind of lead where you'd like to go with this, what you're looking at? Well, I brought with, with us today, Jeremy, to answer a lot of your questions. So, um, I'm gonna defer to him, and if there's some specific to, to me, I can certainly step in, but I, He's an expert on this, and I'd rather him speak to it. Hi, Madam President. Here to answer any questions. Um, I can give you guys a brief overview on, on all the topics. Uh, so when it, when it comes to leases, um, the governing board has the authority to enter into a lease up to 20 years uh, without the need to call for an election. But to go beyond 20 years and go all the way up to 99 years, you would call uh, a site sale question, which is essentially you go out and you ask voters to give you authority to lease, sell, or exchange the land, um, and to go for a period of up to 99 years and to enter the agreement at any point over the next 20 years. Uh, so if the voters authorized and you decided, you know, we don't want to do it right now, but came back 15 years from now, you're like, okay, yeah, now we're ready to do it, that authorization would still be in place. You could start entering into that contract. Um, there is uh, one provision that a good friend of mine, uh, Jim Gale, had reminded me about. Uh, the charters had been pressing for a while to want to have access to district buildings. Um, in 2019, they did get um, a revision to statute uh, passed that would allow you to forego the need for an election if you have a building on the land and the building has been vacant for at least three years. Um, then you don't need, in that instance, you would not need an election to enter into um, a lease agreement or sell, or sell that property. So that's an exclusion. That's, that's not going to count for some of your vacant parcels of land. It is a building has to be on there, and the building has to have been vacant. You haven't used it for the last three years. Then it, then it foregoes the need for an election. Um, but in all other cases, you go out for a question. question. Yes, absolutely, Madam President. When you say that it's been vacant, do you mean vacant of students or just vacant in general? Like, because right now we have tenants that are using the, the uh, Four Peaks building, but the school itself, the Four Peaks school, has been shut down for 11 years now. I believe that, and I don't know if anybody has access to the internet right now. Um, we could read it through real quick. I do. You do? Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah Dr. J, if you could pull up um, www.azleg.gov. Yep. All right, click on the link that says for legislative council and there should be a drop down for Arizona revised statutes. Legislative council. And then there's another drop down below that for Arizona revised statutes. Got it. All right, click on there and then uh, after that go to title 15. Got it. And then go to 342.04. be a paragraph on it. Might need to upgrade our internet service. Oh. I'm kidding. It's, okay, what was it again? Sorry. And have open Wi-Fi too. I think it's on the Wi-Fi. Oh my God. Uh, 342.04. And how long did you say we could enter into that lease? Without 20 years, years. 20. Just yeah so so 20 building. years if you wanted to do if you wanted to do a lease right now you wouldn't have to call for an election if that lease is going to be less than 20 years now if you're trying to do a lease that generates any type of real revenue like the bigger dollars normally before somebody's going to invest into putting something in there that's going to generate real revenue they're they're going to want a lease of 50 plus years so you would have to call for an election in that case whether the building's been vacant or not 
either way you have to go that's what election. we're waiting yeah. for no i got it it okay. says notwithstanding section 15342 an election is not required for the sale or lease of a building or a partially used building if the building has been vacant or partially used pursuant to section 15119 for at least three years so I would consider your situation, like if you're doing that as a, a professional development training center, that would be a partially used example, so that, that would be okay, that would count. You haven't had students there, you're not actually running classes through there. I, I'd say that qualify you that you haven't used it. So you could forego the election in that case. But only for a, at least up to 20 years. No, 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 no. no. For good. The election okay. goes for 20 to 99 years, and so you could go all the way up to the 99 years. Um, the up to 20 years is any building. If you wanted to rent out this building for up to 20 years, um, you could do it. If you wanted to rent out your school next door for up to 20 years, you could do that at any point in time without an election. When you want to go beyond 20, that's what requires the election, but this provision allows that the election is not required if the building was partially used or vacant. So um, using it for a training center, that would be partially used. Uh, you're not running actual classes there. You wouldn't have to do the election in that instance. Um, you could go ahead and enter into a lease agreement and, and go as far out as the 99 years if you want. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but uh, we're talking the building or could we? Building. Yeah. So the building, it's it's the building. So like let's say, and I'm not completely familiar with, with this site, but let's say um, at the site you have a building that has been partially used or yeah, vacant, yeah. but the, the rest of the campus does have students in there and you just recently moved the students out of there and put them into another location no uh, we have a building that we might want to tear down and lease the land oh no that still has to go for election. that would have to go for an election oh. gotcha yeah okay. yeah it's in reference to the building and again it's because the charters pushed that provision sure. and their whole idea was this is this is removing a barrier for us to go to a district and say lisa is your property let us run a charter out of there so that's that's how we got the provision. So, in so we would need an election because of the fact that it's the you're gonna, land. You're going to knock want. it down and you want to use okay. the land. Yeah, Sounds that's, good. That's going to require the election. And I do want to say that as much as you know, you know, hearing that brings a possibility, I just, I, I think hearing from the voters is important on that kind of an issue anyway. Mm -hmm. So I was really struggling with that. So I'm glad we don't have any option, to be and honest. The, and those <laughs> types of questions, um, I have never seen one fail. They usually pass 70-30. Um, so I've never seen the voters say that they wouldn't want to give you the authority to uh, make a good financial decision with your property. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen that happen to a district yet, not even the districts who typically struggle to get support on other questions have I seen that the voters come forward and say, we don't want you to have authority over your own property. Except for the adjacent neighbors. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> this is and is that both <laughs> in a lease and a sale? Yes. Member Settle, uh, Madam President, that would be lease. The question will read to say lease, sale, or exchange. In some instances, you might find yourself uh, through negotiations that um, let's say you're, you're wanting the lease revenue from another property. Like let's say if you were the property that you have right now, because we put schools in nice residential areas, only lends itself really to have homes built on it. But you want ongoing lease revenue. You don't want the one-time sale. You could then exchange that property for another parcel that lends itself to commercial development. And so now you've been covered for that exchange and then now with that property, turn that into a revenue generating uh, property. So it's, it's lease, sell or exchange. Um, it's typically how the question is gonna be worded when they bring it out for you. And this is still up to 20 years for us to be able to do it. So if it's approved, we have up to 20 years, so we yes. have to do that yeah, right away. Correct. Yes, member Acker. So if okay. if it's approved, there's no need to act immediately. Okay. You will have up to 20 years to make that decision. So if um, let's say if you were to cover all of your bases and just get it all done right now, and for all of your vacant parcels and and the the parcel that has the partially used building, if you just ask that all together and just say these are all the parcels that we're asking for this authority on. You would have up to 20 years, and let's say you have an immediate need, you're like, you know what, we have somebody, we have demand for this one parcel, we want to do that one now. But then you come back 10 years later from now, and you're like, you know what, actually this other parcel now, we want to sell that. Um, that, would, that would still stay valid for that, that 20 year authorization period. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify my original question, 
you've seen it pass 70 to 30 with the language lease, sell, or exchange. Absolutely. That's the way it's always worked in Microsoft. Okay. Continue. Like All right. So, um, so overrides, um, and Dr. J, you'll have to remind me which override you guys might be looking at calling, but there's two types of overrides. Um, technically, there's three. The only reason why we still have to say there's three is because there's one district who still uses the special K, but it, and it makes no sense to do it. Um, but there's really two overrides. There's an m and override. It goes up to 15% of your revenue control limit. So that's your per pupil number. Um, so the m and override can go up to 15%. And then you have your capital override uh, that goes up to 10% of the revenue control limit. The, the capital override, the tricky part on the capital override is you are calling for a dollar amount. Um, every year the test is done to make sure that the dollar amount that you have asked for and been approved for does not exceed 10% of the revenue control limit. In the event that it does, you just get brought down to whatever 10% of the revenue control limit equals. Um, now, what, what I typically do is if I'm doing a capital override, I call for the amount that I believe that the 10% will represent seven years from now to make sure that I can grow into it because the base level increases every year. And by doing that, then your capital override increases every year, but you call for the dollar amount purse. So to give an example, in, in Tolleson Union, 10% um, of the revenue control limit when we first called for the capital override represented 7.3 million. I called for about 9.8. Um, it, now 10% of the revenue control limit represents about 9.3. So we've almost completely grown into the amount that we called for. Uh, but on the pamphlet, it will word as the full number that you call for, um, and it'll always be pulled back down to the lesser of 10% of the revenue control limit or the capital override amount. For a capital override, it stays in effect for seven years. So once you call for it, it stays in effect for seven years. Um, and then after the seven years, it completely goes away unless you have called for another capital override. Uh, capital overrides are interesting in that you can stack. The really the only district I ever see stacking them is Gilbert. Um, and, and so with the stacking, the way it works is if, if your capital override is for, like you want to do your capital override, and this is kind of like some of the reasoning behind Gilbert's, uh, they would always do theirs for like a very specific purpose. And so they would call for a capital override for that, and it would be well below the 10% cap. Um, they would think a couple years later, oh, actually, we need more capital funding for this other thing we want to do now. They would call for another capital override for that, and they would have them stacked up. And then after they did that, now they have overlapping expirations because you have one dropping off after this seven years, but the other one's still got two more years left. And then they just found themselves continually keeping their override stacked like that. I don't recommend that approach whatsoever, uh, but but that is that is allowed for with capital overrides to allow for a stack. You still can't exceed 10% of the revenue control limit in any given year. The uh, the more standard approach is you call for a capital override. Let's say if it's supporting your technology, you, you call for that amount, and then and then you would just keep renewing it to make sure you have that continued support to take care of. Like if you're doing one-to-one -one devices or something, that you have a continued revenue stream that's addressing you, maintaining that one-to-one -one device ratio. And bond, the last one. Uh, so bonds, uh, when you call for a bond, um, that, that authorization um, will stay good for 10 years. Uh, so you'll have a 10-year period to issue a bond. Um, so let's say you call for a bond authorization of $25 million. Um, you can break that $25 million up into any number of issuances that you want. Even after you put it into the voter information pamphlet, you can still change your mind and break that up into a different number of issuances. So let's say you call for, for $25 million authorization on bond. And your original plan is, you know what, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and issue $10 million of that right now, and then we're going to come back and we're going to issue another $15 million of it three years from now. Maybe that's your original plan. Uh, but then after you start to get into things, you're like, you know what, actually we want to change that. We want to do $5 million right now, then $10 million in two years, and then another $10 million two years after that. You can do that. That's fine. You can, you can change up from how you put it into the pamphlet. The pamphlet has to show um, the scenario you believe you're going with, but you can, you can then change. You can then change that um, as you go and change that up as your needs change. 
Um, to give an example, Phoenix Elementary, um, another district I've uh, been helping out, they originally had planned on uh, three issuances, but then they more, they, they got to assess their needs. Um, they have now changed their mind and moved that into two issuances. So they took their authorization and spread it out over two issuances instead of three issuances. Uh, when you get into the point of when you're ready to make issuances, there's a couple of things you always take into consideration. One is it's, look at it like uh, when you take money out of the ATM machine, right? When you go to the ATM machine, um, you're not going to take out 20 bucks at a time because you're going to get hit with the transaction fee every time you take money out of the ATM machine. And so nobody really goes up to an ATM machine and says, Oh, I'm gonna take 20 bucks and then come back after lunch of like, I'm gonna grab another 20 bucks, right? You, you kind of take out whatever cash you think you need to have on your pocket for, for you know, a reasonable amount of time. Um, the, so you don't, want, you don't want to do too many issuances. You're gonna incur some costs on each issuance. Um, the other side of it though is you don't want to go for, when you do issue, you don't want to issue over issue. Uh, so, like, let's say you get authorization to issue $25 million, and you're like, well, let's just make sure we only have one transaction cost. We're just going to issue the whole $25 million on day one. Um, but you don't spend it for five, six years. Uh, what ends up happening is if you're sitting on cash for more than three years, you're going to start going through what's called arbitrage calculations. Um, essentially, what that means is... You're not allowed to make money off of money. Um, so you will have to call somebody in who is going to do the analysis to make sure you're not making money off your money. Because after you issue, that money is sitting in your bank account, and it's earning interest. When you issued, you had a repayment plan that you paid out interest. The money you, you're making from that money sitting in your bank account cannot exceed the money you're paying for interest to pay back that debt. So somebody has to start doing that calculation. You usually don't worry about that unless you've sat on the money for over three years and, and kind of haven't made up a decision on how to spend it and it's just been sitting in your bank account. Somebody has to come in and do that calculation. And then all they do is, is um, just start adjusting all of your money at that point to make sure you're back into a situation where you're just breaking even. You're, the interest you're earning can just break even with the interest you're paying. So they'll, they'll do that. So, um, you try to right size the issuance. The magic target is three years. So when it comes time to issue from the authorization, you would you would just want to think about what are we planning on doing over the next three years? How much is that going to cost us? That's how much we want to issue for. So magic is three when it comes time to, to issue. But the authorization will stay valid for the entire 10 years. If uh, you're, you find yourself in the event that um, you have ask for more than later on what you decide you need. You don't have to, you don't have to issue all of it. So voters can give you approval for a hundred million and all of a sudden you decide, you know what, actually, we don't think we need to spend that much money. We want to, we don't want to only spend 20. You can only spend 20. The authorization will just expire on its own after 10 years. So um, don't be, don't be too concerned that if you ask for an authorization too high, um, that, that all of a sudden there's going to be some wasted money. You're still going to make the decision every time an issuance gets made from that authorization. So it's, it's like, say you have a kid that you trust, right? And, and you give him your card and tell him he has permission to go spend 30 bucks on, on dinner. If he doesn't spend the 30, you trust that he's actually gonna bring it back to you. He's not gonna just waste the rest of, you know, the 30 bucks on something else just for the sake of, of spending it, right? So um, the authorization just gives you that authority to spend up to that amount. When you start doing the issuances, that's when you're figuring out how much do we do we really need right now to, to cover what our needs are. Um, Jeremy, can you, can you yes, explain sorry. a little bit? You did this for me a while back, but um, you said we were in good shape with bonds, like as a community. Oh, outstanding. Can you can you bonds. talk about that? And then also, like our tax rate and stuff. You yes. mentioned if it got too low. There, there may be an issue for us. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, you guys are in outstanding shape. So uh, when, you, when you look at, at, at school districts and how they're running their bond program, there's a couple of things that you look at. Um, one is how much capacity do they have to continue using the bond program to actually go out, get new authorizations, 
make new issuances, right? So they're looking at the limit, same way you would look at like your credit card limit, right? You're like, you wanna know how much, how much is still sitting on that credit card limit. So you kind of look at that. The other piece you look at is, is what is the tax rate associated with their, with their current bond debt? Um, the same way you would look at your payment for the credit card, right? Is that manageable? Um, you guys are down like around 22 cents, I, I wanna say at the top of my head. I know it's in that ballpark. Um, for districts that have an ongoing bond program, I, I don't come across districts that low on a tax rate. Now, a good piece of that is uh, because it's beautiful out here and you guys have such high assessed values for all, for all the homes and everything else that you have out here. Um, but also, uh, you know, the, the, the district has uh, been somewhat frugal with how they've been using the bond program as well. Um, so you don't, you don't have a lot of outstanding bond debt and that keeps you at a nice low bond tax rate. Uh, the, the problem with when the tax rate starts to get too low, it's one of those things where um, it's um, easy, easy to give, hard to give back. Uh, if, if the tax rate starts to get too low, then when you finally do start to use the bonds, um, then it makes it look like a tax spike, right? And so that's, that's something you really want to avoid is, is doing any kind of tax spikes. You, you like to do leveling with your tax rate. Um, a, a lot of the, the firms out there, when they, when they give you proposals on how they're going to structure your bonds and your bond debt repayment, like they will present to you a level tax rate structure because the assumption, the basic assumption is every district wants to keep their tax rate nice and level. That is the basic assumption unless they're given different direction. That's what they're trying to do is figure out how can we structure this in a way that you keep your payment level. Um, look, think of it when you go into a car dealership and you're about to trade up on your car. First question the salesman asks you, what are you currently paying on the car you drive? Right? Because their assumption is, that's what you can manage. I want to keep you in the same ballpark of what you can manage. Now, they don't care if you only have two payments left on that. They know you've been paying on that car for five years at that rate. If you've managed to get by for five years paying that rate, they're assuming you can get by for the next five with the same level payment. Right? So that's that's... That's kind of the basic assumption, and that's that's kind of the approach that you know Stiefel and some of the other guys will take when they present you with a bond repayment plan. Is they're assuming that you can get by at the same level tax rate uh, that the community has been paying. So the more that drops off, the less room you have then for you know issuing out new debt and doing new payments because now it, it, like at some point, I mean, if you're if you're a car payment, you're going into a dealer and like, well, actually, I refinance and. I'm paying 50 bucks a month on my car. Uh, what can you get me into that has a $50 a month payment? It's gonna be tough. Uh, I don't know what kind of vehicle that, I mean, that might show you some good 10 speeds or something, but I, <laughs> I don't know what you get into for 50 bucks. So at some point when, you're, when your bond uh, debt repayment starts to get too low, it doesn't leave a lot of room in there for you to continue your bond program and still keep that tax rate level. Um, and so that's why there's, there's different things that you can do to manage the tax rate. Um, but some of that is, yeah, going out for a bond and then structuring that repayment to say, okay, we've, we've gotten very low, but let's go ahead and put a new bond out there and go ahead and maintain at that same level before we get down to a tax rate of like two cents. Uh, because uh, without, any, without any new bond, that's what happens. It, it just phases itself out to where you're not paying anything anymore. And what's our capacity for bond right now, roughly? Oh, I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll tell you, it's unless you're building like two new schools, you're not touching it anyway. You, you guys have plenty of capacity. There's not gonna, you're, you're not gonna see any issues with capacity. Okay. Thank you. Jerry, the authorization is good for, I lost track, 10, ten. ten. ten years. Mm -hmm. So if we, uh, we've talked about a $25,000 need over a period of time, if that period of time is 20 years, then it, over the course of that time, we're going to have to go through two bond authorizations. Yes, yes, member. Sorry, if um, if if you think that um, the twenty five million is is you're not going to remember the the limitation on the ten years is for the issuance, not for the repayment. You get right. twenty years after each right. issuance to repay. But if during the ten years you're not going to use up twenty five million, um, what would end up happening? Let's say you get the authorization now for for twenty five million. And at each time of issuance, you know, the board decides, you know what, we, we actually don't think we need to issue too much here. Um, and you get to the 10-year period and you're, and you're like, we've only issued 15 million. 
of this twenty-five million dollar authorization. The ten, the other ten million, it just expires. Yeah, right. You just there's no there's no debt associated with it. The authorization itself just expires, and at that point in time, then you would just go back to the voters and ask them once again uh, to do a new authorization. Now, conversely, let's say if you did if the opposite thing happened to you, so let's say that you ask for twenty million, and over the next ten years, you actually decide that you know what we need thirty million. Like there's been escalation on uh, construction costs, we have inflation we're dealing with. Like actually, we should have asked for thirty million. You will have to go out for another election now to get that additional authorization. <coughs> and going out for an election, again, just like running back to the ATM, that incurs a transactional cost. It costs you money to put a question on the ballot. It costs you money to produce all those voter information pamphlets. It, I mean, all of this stuff, like it's it's added cost. So it's again one of those things where, if you can uh, if you can avoid it, you don't want to be back in front of the voters every like three or four years, like. With, with your bond, you would like to be able to call it at a level where it actually was right size for 10 years and you don't have to ask the voters to authorize a new bond again for, for 10 years if, uh, if you actually pick the right number. Um, I understand you guys have had a needs assessment conducted before. I'm pretty sure the needs assessment has shown uh, more than 25 million um, in what you could do to, to bring all of your capital facilities up to speed. Um, the thing that they don't look at with the needs assessment, which I always encourage. Um, MO is limited, and a lot of things we want to do have to get paid for with MO. Uh, so, something I always encourage is give yourself plenty of room for furniture, technology, and equipment within that bond. Uh, there's some things you do on the structure of the repayment to, to make sure you can use that money for furniture, technology, and equipment, but in doing so, you can start to move all of your capital costs over into bond and by freeing up that capital you can now take your district additional assistance and transfer it over to m and and so now when you're talking about having to pay you know to send uh, special education students out or you want to go get that fifth grade teacher like now you have more m and in the bank to be able to do something like that by by doing that those couple of little shifts right there so i always say um, the capital needs assessment those are great Always allow yourself a little bit of cushion there, though, so you can move some other things in there and free up money over here that you can now put into your M&O bucket, and now you have more M&O money to work with. So you brought up a really good point, and, and technology was a big part of that. Um, it has a shorter life than a physical facility, so the, the state has said um, you can't use 20-year bond uh, payment to, to take to buy technology that only has a five-year life. Yes. Yeah. So that's where a lot of districts have used the capital override because that's a year-to-year -year, uh, revenue source. And so they're used that for technology and furnishings and so forth that have that shorter life where the bond is usually put into long-term um, capital, which is buildings and, and infrastructure. Does that all make sense? Yes, absolutely, Member Sar and uh, Madam President. That has always been the traditional approach. Um, it, it wasn't until the Great Recession that we even got the flexibility to do furniture, technology, and equipment out of bond. But when they gave us the flexibility to do furniture, technology, and equipment out of bond, it, it came with the caveat of when you look at your bond debt repayment, whatever you are repaying within the first five years after that issuance, that is the max amount you can use for furniture, technology, and equipment. Um, and so if, if uh, with Stiefel you're communicating that need up front, they will structure your bond debt repayment in a way to make sure that you have sufficient funds available to be able to use for furniture, technology, and equipment. Um, the, the capital override is a great way to cover uh, technology needs, and it is because of that that you know that devices always have to be refreshed, right? These things will wear out on us after five years. You're going to need to get a whole other set of laptops. Um, the infrastructure, I mean, the access points and everything else, the Wi-Fi that you guys wouldn't let me get on, um, <laughs> all that stuff, right, it all has to get replaced. Um, and so you know those things are running on a life cycle. Well, with a, with a capital override, when you have a good capital override program covering all those technology needs, then you know you have that nice, steady revenue stream that you have set up now to go with those nice, steady costs. And, and you don't buy all of your devices in one year, but you break it up where it's like you have a rotation plan 
So you can try to level out the expense. You have the level revenue, you get the two married up, and then there you go, you have a revenue stream that's covering that, that ongoing expense that's coming back up. I have a question. Um, you mentioned about the 20 year repayment. When we went out for our bond this past year, one of the things that we heard from the community was that 20 years is too long to repay it. Are there shorter bond repayments? Is there a benefit Absolutely. to doing that? Like Absolutely, Madam President. And that is completely at your discretion how long you want to take to, to repay. It's like with your, with your house, right? A standard mortgage is 30 years, um, but someone might tell you, if you can afford to do a 15-year mortgage, do a 15-year mortgage. You're going to save a lot more money in the long run. You're not going to incur as much interest costs and everything else. It's the same with your bond. Um, you don't have to pay it back over 20 years. You can pay, it, you can pay the whole thing back in five if you wanted to. Um, you, you set those terms uh, with your council when they are going out to issue bonds for you. So if you tell them, you know what, we want a 10-year repayment plan on this. We don't want it going for 20 uh, we want a 10-year repayment plan on this, and, and maybe the mindset is the preschoolers that are with us now, you know, yeah, you know, the kindergartners that are with us now, in 10 years they will have gone through high school, and, and we want the debt, you know, to be basically the life cycle of when the students are in the school. Whatever the reason is, you don't even have to give them reasoning. You just tell them, limit it to 10 years, they will go do that. They will make sure that they structure it for a 10-year repayment. The 20-year is, is merely the cap. It is, it can't go beyond 20. Um, it, it used to be a lot easier uh, to do things that would take us uh, beyond 20. Uh, for anyone who was trying to manage the tax rate, there used to be refundings. Um, used to be a lot easier to refund your bond and then kick it out for another new 20. That's gotten more difficult lately. And so the standard is, yeah, you're looking at a 20 year cap on how long uh, you, can, you can spread this out. The reason why districts go for 20 is to minimize the impact on the tax rate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it makes a smaller payment. Same reason somebody takes a 30-year mortgage. You take a 30-year mortgage because you can manage that mortgage payment. When they show you the 15-year mortgage and you're like, oh, I love how much interest savings there is, but then you see the payment and you're like, yeah, I'd have to get a much smaller house than if I'm gonna do that. So no, I think I'm good. Go ahead and give me the standard 30. I'll, I'll stick with that. So that's how that works as well. Do we, have, do we know the amount of, that we're going to ask for with our bond? Nope, that's, that's your guys', guys decision. That. Yeah. Would Steve will be able to give us a breakdown of, like, if we gave a, a number, 25 million, what the 10 year looks like and what a 20 year looks like? Is that something they would be able to give oh, us? Oh, absolutely, Dr. J. Matter of fact, don't tell them I said this. I can even give you like five or six scenarios if you want to consider it. <laughs> they don't get paid until you issue. So all of this prep work that they're doing for you, it's free. It's free. So, uh, <laughs> so don't tell them I said that. But no, I, if you want to look at five or six scenarios, I would have them bring you five or six scenarios. You could look at different amounts. You could look at different issuance structures. Um, any scenarios you want, you just tell them the scenario. They, they write it up for you. They'll come present it for you and everything. And you could see how that works out on the tax rate, how much money that makes available for furniture, technology, and equipment. They will, do, they will do all the scenarios you want, and it doesn't change how much they get paid at time of issuance. Either way, they're getting paid at time of issuance, and it's going to be the same amount based on the bond size. So, yeah, I, I would act absolutely, like, for anyone who, like, does I mean, I over-leverage those guys, so they know. They, got, they all got me on a first-name basis. They're, you know, I, I have, I, I'll call, I called one of them up right now, in a way, and, like, they already know I'm going to call them on a regular basis, but they get paid at time of issuance. So if you, had a, if you had a DA override, which we do not have, and a bond, we kind of, last election, we saw what that would cost, you know, on average. But if you just had a bond at a 10-year payback, would that be similar to having the two? Depends on the size of the bond. Okay. Um, if, if, you, if you price the bond right where it's going to cover all of your technology needs, and if you structure the repayment right where the, the first five years of that repayment are going to occur to cover all those technology, mm -hmm. furniture, and equipment needs, then, then yes. You, you could, you could uh, do a bond of the right size where it, it would cover both of the needs and then there wouldn't be any need to ask for it. But it would also be money. similar to what it would have cost if we went, say, 20 years out plus a DA override. So I'm, I'm trying to say, like, 
In, in terms of cost to the taxpayer? Yeah, so if we did a 10 year, but only a bond and no override, would that be a similar cost to the taxpayer? So I'm gonna take it two different ways. Okay. Um, one, when we look at cost to the taxpayer, we are talking about total amount of money out of your pocket in order for the district to receive this benefit. When you're looking at it that way, it's capital override is the best bet. Um, but when you look at, in terms of the taxpayer being able to manage the payment, then bond is gonna be the best bet. Um, capital overrides are pay-as-you-go plans, right? So there's no interest associated with a capital override. Bond is a debt. There is interest tied into the debt. Um, so for the taxpayer, they are paying the interest on that associated debt. There is no debt with capital override. When you look at the impact of the tax rate though, a capital override is gonna give you a bigger impact to the tax rate because it's not being financed. You are paying that like on the spot. So it, 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 it feels a little bit more impactful to the taxpayer because they're seeing a, a bigger increase on their tax rate, but it's saving them money because you're not incurring any interest costs. And again, it's like that 30 year, 15 year mortgage type of conversation where it's like, do you, do you want to save on interest costs or do you want a more manageable payment? Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's all about balancing out where you want those needs. Um, but if you, if you, you know, I'm, I'm like Google. If you guys tell me where you want to go for lunch, I'll give you directions and everything else. So if you, if you, if you just give me direction on what it is you guys are trying to accomplish, I could, I could give you the perfect plan for that. So if you're like, hey, look, we really only want to do this to our taxpayers, but we see needs of this, What's the best way to get there? I, I can map that. So I think our, our what we've shared is as much as having the funding to do the other things that are needed is important, the buildings themselves have to be addressed. Whether it's today or it's five years or 10 years down the road, they're not gonna just stay good forever. So, so we have to address that. And so my, I guess, the pathway would be is what would be for you know if, if the committee is concerned about a 20-year payback what would be that I guess that sweet spot of a 10-year payback and the amount to cover our costs the the last report that we have is you know four years out of date now when with with inflation it's it's not a good number anymore yeah, yeah it's just not so, so we'd have to factor that in too but what I'm trying to what concerns me the most is the condition of the buildings today and what they're going to look like down the road. And like I've said, I have tried to cut where I can, and there's, there's just no money to fix those. Yeah. It's just not there. I mean, you've seen our, our books. so there's, there's nothing. We have some money for savings, which we're, we're trying to bring in more students. But outside of this, this effort, there's... And, and 2.5 million is not going to make a big dent in what we have looking at us. So there's so many factors that come into this, teacher pay, salaries, retention, all these things matter because when you start losing these teachers, you start losing enrollment. And when you lose enrollment, you lose m and and it's just a cycle. So trying to get the enrollment up, and we've made strides this year, but I think where we're where I, I feel the biggest concern is is with the buildings not only being updated and, and fixed, but also being renovated so that it brings more students into our district. Absolutely. So if the if the community sticking point is that that they would like to see a ten year repayment uh, to help lower interest costs, um, then then you know I I'd almost propose that you do and. Of course, the, the messaging gets tough out there with the community to say, look, we're doing this because this is exactly what you guys asked for. But um, doing a combination of, of capital override and bond uh, would be the best way to achieve that for the community because it, if you did it through a combination, you could, keep, you could keep the tax rates somewhat manageable by working the bond. Um, but you could also get those needs addressed and keep interest costs down because if they're asking for a 10 instead of a 20, that means they're concerned about interest costs. You keep those interest costs down by using the capital override. And so doing a combination of the two, and even on the bond, you can still limit the repayment of each bond issuance to a 10-year cycle. 
Um, but doing that combination would then kind of satisfy both things. <laughs> uh, you wanted to keep the interest costs down, um, but you also want to try to manage the tax rate a bit. A combination of the two would do that. Messaging, though, so that everybody knows, like, oh, now they're asking for two things. Messaging's tough. Um, I, would, I would say, you know, how difficult it would be to articulate to the community that you are doing this to give the best solution to exactly what they, they asked for. That's going to be tough. More than likely, you'd end up losing one of the questions. So. Well, that's what we just had this past election. We lost both. So yeah. we lost our capital and the bond. So, and we'd already lost the capital the year before. So this yeah. would be the third year we'd be going back out for the capital. And while nobody wants to pay higher taxes, and that certainly was a conversation from the community, was, you know, they didn't want a higher tax rate. The other thing was it, they didn't want to do it for 20 years because with declining enrollment, they're like, is the district even going to be here in 20 years? So if you're not going to be here in 20 years, we don't want to be paying on a bond that, you know, for 20 years when the district may not be there. So that's where I'm looking, you know, would it be better to go for a shorter bond, you know, shorter time period? It, you know, and yes, it's going to be a higher payment, just like you said, a 15 versus 30 year mortgage. But hopefully, you know, it, it's I, I got a, I got a great counter argument to that, Madam President. I, I'd love if somebody would ask me that question. If if someone is thinking that the district's not going to be here for 20 years, then I would say the best interest for the district would be to not only do a 20 year repayment, but to have it all paid back in the 20th year. So if like Scottsdale Unified absorbed you, then all of Scottsdale Unified would have to pay off that debt. <laughs> and your tax rates would be great at that point. Anyone who acquires you acquires your outstanding debt. I'm like, you want to take us over? Good, here's the bill. <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, if that was their concern, I'm like, no, you, you would want to, if you think we're getting you know, assume somehow through an election at some point somebody's getting something going. Okay, good. Let them take the debt with them too. Your your tax rate would not only be low for the first nineteen, but then in twenty year when the big bill was due, we would go drop it over there on right there on, on Scottsdale Road, like, hey, here you guys go. <laughs> Have fun with that. And they got the money, they'll pay for it, but it's still Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. That's good to know. And um in my conversations, I, I don't believe anyone is interested in, in us to begin with, number one. And number two, um, I just, again, our enrollment is up. And we're one, I mean, how many districts can say that, right? Like, it's up for the first time in a long time. And I just think we need to capitalize on that momentum of it being up because um, you have to provide public school. So you're going to either be here, or, like you said, someone's going to take that debt off of us anyway. So that's a great... Yeah. It's a great argument. Thank you for that. Awesome. No one thought about that. <laughs> Can, uh, you had mentioned that you could suggest a number for us. I think that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, I mean, I if you look at the Gordon report, it was 27.9. You take out the two buildings that we're not using. I think that it resulted in nine. So it was about 18, 19 million off that report. You factor into it, you know, inflation. I think 25 million is probably where you want to be. Um, if we want to really go... Uh, and put an emphasis on school safety, then I think you got to factor that in as well. I've already showed you there's some great, great things happening with school safety um, in the classroom, uh, but it's expensive. And so if that's something we want to do and provide this town and make that a, a hallmark of this district is this is, you know, we've, we've, we've tried to make it as safe as possible for families and kids, um, you know, you might be looking at 30 then if you want to do something like that, because that, that can get pricey fast. And, and but I also think that, again, you know, if, if, we're, if our goal is, is to get every building up to code, every building up to speed, everything replaced, so it's like a brand new, you know, brand new district, it should last for 20 years. Like, we shouldn't be going out again anytime soon, right, if we've, if, if we've accomplished those goals. And... Um, and that would be our priorities to make sure that all the buildings are where they need to be. And I think you want to have some additional money in there to, to put things in to, to raise enrollment and grow, um, put some things in there for that. But that, those are minor costs in comparison to the whole, the whole district. A couple. 
So you just referred to the Gordian report, right? And at the 27.9, you took out Four Peaks and McDowell. We're still utilizing half, or will be utilizing half of McDowell unless the interest, entrance is changed. So I don't think we can totally wipe out McDowell. And then early in your conversation, I don't even think we can look at a number of 19.5 based on inflation and the new costs. So I feel like everything with this has just been spitballed numbers. And you know, we you did the presentation, and I appreciate that at the last meeting that's here in our packet. But again, it has ideas, but no numbers attached. And I think that that's a problem. Well, we're, we're working on it, but let me go back. McDowell Mountain is not gonna be half used. It's gonna be one wing of the building is gonna be used, okay? It already is But works. we're still using the office, you said, we'll be using the front entrance. The kids will be using the gym. So that really is more than one wing. We're closing the front office over, essentially. We're not. We're looking at adding a new office in the music room. We have plans we're working on to get a quote for that and a price for that as part of the consolidation project. That building is much newer. We, we, we've already discussed that. That building is much newer. Does it need some work yet? But I don't think it needs $5 million worth of work. The gym is only being used as an additional space because it's available and it's there. I don't think it needs to have a new gym floor be completely renovated for our purposes. Our hope is that as enrollment grows, there may be more of a need there, but I don't, I, I don't, I don't see that building needing uh, a large sum of money to continue to build the preschool of what we're trying to do over there. Um, as far as getting you know, quotes for every single thing that's on there, um, that's something John's working on. I, I don't know how many companies are going to come out and give us a quote for the whole district. I think we're going to have to use our consultants and people that we work with to get a, a an estimated cost of what those types of things are going to cost but we're not going to be able to come back and say you know that every single roof in the district costs this and every air conditioner costs that and i don't think that's possible to get done i think it's going to be more of these are the needs of the district these are our priorities of the district and this is where that money is going to go so yeah I, I think Libby's concern is just that it will be a deterrent for our community if they don't feel like they have some hard and fast numbers tied to the projects, I feel. Because I think that that was something that played a role in the last election is people felt like they didn't know where it was going. The information said the same thing that it had before where it was for safety, it was for teachers, it was for athletics. You know, they, they saw the same messaging and, and they're not seeing the actual projects. But nothing, okay, so if this is decided that this is what we're going to do, we will have that before we send out, we go out and get our pamphlet together and all those types of things. We'll, we'll have that information in there. Um, but again, I don't believe it's going to be a specific estimate to every single thing in our entire district. Someone's going to give us a quote for it. It's going to be a, you know, taking what the Gordon report has done, if we need to bring them back in and give us updated numbers and updated, we could look at that as a possibility, but we know that air conditioners need to replace. We know that roofs need to be replaced. Those are things we can get a, a pretty close estimate to. And we would have, uh, I've always said this from the beginning of going back even to the first election, is that we will have a committee of, of stakeholders that will help drive where that money is spent and where it goes. Yeah, and, and, and just to add on to that, um, you can, so you can get another needs assessment done prior to the election. Um, you wouldn't be able to get another needs assessment done fast enough prior to the deadline to call for the election. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll agree with Dr. J that, I mean, you, you've got one month basically uh, to turn this all around. And I haven't looked at your guys' board meeting schedule, but whatever you have in May as, as your schedule, I mean, that's that's gonna be the, they would have to complete a needs assessment that fast. It's not, it wouldn't necessarily move that fast to get it done for the call, but you could definitely get a needs assessment done um, prior to the actual election, so you could share that information. And I would focus on whatever amount you call for. So when I say in an ideal world, you could call for an election that will cover you for the 10 years. That's an ideal world. Um, realistically, you got to call for whatever the voters are going to say yes to. 
So, so the voters are only going to approve 19, then I say you call 19, you come back in two or three more years, you show how you've used the 19, and you say, and now we need another 20. So when we call for the election, we have to specify the bond amount mm -hmm. at that same time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which has, Before so we can bank compile bank. the information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, to you're, you're not going to. Yeah, you're not going to have it. You're not going to have an easy assessment by May 9th. Or by May 11th. But the, cons May 11th. but the concern I think we would run into with that is you went out for a bond and now you're asking for another one. The question is going to be, well, where yeah. did that money go? Yeah. Right? No, but, but you can show them at that point. You can show them the project. I, I get yeah, it. And, I get it. But it's still another. And it's a cost for calling another question. But it's another, again, it's another whole there. process to go through it again. And it's not going to be, you know, is it really going to be within 10 years? I mean, that's the other question, right? I mean, if it's not within 10 years, now you got two. I think we would do better. I mean, I, I understand that there's a cost every time that we go for an election. But I think that it's going to be a process of rebuilding the trust with the community. And so if we need to scale back so that we have more confident numbers tied to projects and then go for more when we really need it. I think that that would go along with our community. I'm not saying that's what we should do, but I think that we need to be confident in whatever we're asking for, both that we need it and that the community is going to say yes. And if, you, and if you do a smaller number, then I would say do it all in one issuance. So if you end up going with a smaller number and looking at your needs assessment, I would go ahead and do it all with one issuance. So what you're spending on doing um, an extra election, you'll you'll save back on, on some of your issuance costs by doing it in one issuance instead of splitting it up over multiple. And so, like, let's say if you went with, you know, 18, 19, do that all as one issuance. Um, that's, that's already uh, considered a small issuance as it is. And, of course, they compare that to larger districts that have much larger issuances. Um, but you would do that all in one issuance. Start, you know, you're going to have to draw a line on the projects and figure out, like, Obviously, this is not going to cover all the projects, so you're going to draw a line somewhere and say, this is what we're going to cover. If you want to use some of it to open up M&O funding to be able to use for other things like salaries, then uh, factor into that top tier of the list some furniture, technology, and equipment, so you could transfer over your DAA over to M&O. Um, but you will be back on the ballot again probably like in two years at that point to, to then come back and address the rest of the list. Anyone have any questions, comments? Well, there's six different items that we talked about tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And all have value uh, to our goal of educating students, right? Um, I, you know, we all have talked to our people, but uh, my feeling is number one on your mind right now is what are we going to do with the land and, and the buildings? Um, and even though there's no short-term revenue in selling or leasing those buildings, it's two years or more out, and our needs are today, that's a, a good way to talk about a bond because the money comes in, you know, if the election's in November, we could go to that first authorization in January and, and start working on things. But I don't think that's going to pass. Uh, I think uh, the community wants us to use the resources we have first even though it's going to put things out there. And is that going to affect the enrollment? Certainly will. So it's not an easy decision to make on what we do, because we do have unusual situation with, with uh, real assets. Um, most districts don't have that luxury. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's not quick capital. I mean, it's long term, uh, and our needs are now. So my question is, um, you know, we've got a couple of weeks to make this decision as to what we're going to do. Um, I think, you know, you know, four or five more meetings between now and May 9th uh, <laughs> is the only way we're going to get done. I, I don't see it happening any other way. I don't disagree with you about the land, um, but what the only thing with that is I, I agree that during the last election, I heard a lot of why don't they use their resources, why don't they sell the land? until you actually go to sell the land. And then people are like, wait, wait, we don't really want any more people here. So it's kind of a no-win situation there because like you said, first of all, it's not instant capital. Like the chances of us finding somebody to buy the land, you know, get it developed the way that they want it. Now granted, we don't have to develop it, but still somebody won't buy it until they know that they can develop it. So then it puts it off. 
you know, for a couple years before we can actually get anything out of it. And, you know, at the land, you know, our last assessment last February put, you know, all the parcels of land, the, the vacant parcels at about 13 million. Again, that's not going to give us what we need to fix our buildings. And, you know, there's a notice at the, you know, the Fountain Hotel that they want to turn it into apartments, and that's already like a big controversy. So the fact that we are going to put that land up for sale and, and have a developer come in and destroy the auroras and you know be disruptive and have trucks coming in and stuff, I think we're going to get a lot of flack on that. But you know, the the bond is the easiest you know way to go about getting the funding that we need. It's just what, how much is that funding? So. I, I want to go back to the leasing of our empty building. And just for knowledge's sake, not that it's anything we've ever discussed, but when you said that you could lease it without it going out to the voters mm -hmm. because it sat empty, if there weren't zoning issues, it could be leased to any type of business. Based and, on that statute, and member settle, uh, Madam President, zoning doesn't apply to school districts, so you can lease to anyone. So town zoning would not apply to our apply. property. It doesn't apply. So, and I'm telling you the, the legal response: zoning does not apply to school districts. So you you can you can do what you want. Now, politically, um, I don't know your guys' relationship with the town, and and uh, I, I don't know what the town would approve of, but legally, zoning doesn't apply to school districts. So that as, long as, as long as we own the property. As long as you own the property, that's right. correct. But so we own two school buildings, mm -hmm. and we have one leased out to some nonprofits and some kid-related uh, businesses. Um, but we had a business in there that was disruptive, and we got a violation notice from the town. And what they said is, you're using that as a commercial property, and you're zoned residential. So how does that not apply? I, I would have got legal and applied it. It doesn't apply. Zoning doesn't yeah. apply to school districts. Thank you. And but if we, you guys are on prepaid legal, you could have just grabbed your, your lawyer off the trust and they would have bought it for you, but zoning doesn't yeah. apply to school districts. And I did check with him. I'd have to go back and look at his response at the time. But, um, but if we lease the building, who's going to, I just don't know who's going to come in there and take it. Like it's in such bad shape. So we're talking about if, if we want to lease the land, it's still got to go to the election. If we're going to lease the building, it wouldn't, but... Correct, but if you're only wanting to put one or two items on the ballot, most likely putting that on when we have an immediate capital need, need potentially with your conversation, I'm just trying to explore other options. So that building, if while well, he's here and we can find out if that can be leased, to anybody and zoning doesn't apply I think that's good knowledge to have sure in the future not necessarily pertaining to any direction that I may feel we need to go right but it would need an election to do that we no. can just do that right now no. right. Right. now that's permitting permitting still applies you're still going through the town for any permitting so right. that building needs to be altered some way Correct. Um, you know you're still gonna have to go through permits. So that's why I'm saying like legally zoning doesn't apply um, but but always making sure that you have a good relationship with the other municipalities is important. Yep. So, you know, you guys would, would navigate that uh, the way you would when you look at who you're bringing in. Thank you. Are there any, are any other questions or comments for Jeremy? No. Thank you so much for all your information. I greatly Absolutely. appreciate you coming and answering our questions. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take the rest of the day off. <laughs> and you always come when we have like these long meetings, Jerry. Thank you. Okay, so we still got an hour and a half to go. <laughs> no, we don't, Dana. <laughs> this meeting was supposed to be over at seven. Not a chance. Um, yeah, work study sessions only go to seven. But um, nonetheless, so this is going to come up at our May ninth meeting. If we feel that we need to have another meeting to have to discuss this more and get more information, we certainly can add another meeting just to talk about this, the land and the election. Can I ask a question about uh, the prior, last year when we, the district decided to go out, 
Did you have that information from Stiefel before? Thank you. Yeah, that, you know, um, we've got outstanding debt now. Right. And there's a spreadsheet that's been around as long as I have that keeps track of all that. Yeah. And when each issuance, and it's by issuance, not by authorization, each issuance is tracked. And, you know, it's kind of a sloping deal. As, as the first issuance is paid off, you know, that goes away. And as we've added other things uh, over the years, uh, the last one being, I believe, 13 million to build a middle school or something like that. I forget the exact numbers, but um, yeah, that's there. And all we're doing is saying, okay, and it's not the authorization that's the issue, it's the issuance when it comes to paying things back. And you can prepay it, just like you can a mortgage. I mean, there's no reason to, uh, if, if reasons say that, yeah, we, um, we can refinance because interest rates right now, let's face it, are not as good as they were uh, four years ago. We can say we can refinance our existing de indebtedness, and sometimes it's by issuance. So maybe issuance uh, two and three on the chart can be refinanced, and we can either use that uh, savings to um, pay down the debt, or um, you know, um, pay to pay down the, the taxes that pay that debt. I hope I did that right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but anyway. Uh, and, and as he said, if, if, if we go for $30 million and, and we have a committee that, of citizens that agree to how we spend it, we may never have to, you know, you only got 10 years uh, to, to do it. When we had at the district, uh, at the community college district, our bond authorization was for a billion two and had to be spent within 10 years. Well, we didn't. It just went away. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, making sure that you talked about the trust of, of the five of us and the district uh, staff, I think um, in the last bond we had a um, citizens group called the Bond uh, Oversight Committee, Bond Oversight Committee, made up of uh, business people here in town. Uh, a bunch of accountants, if I remember right, Dan involved in others, that had the confidence of the community. There were no politicians involved because nobody has politicians <laughs> on the top of their list. And so they were all business people. And, um, and we had no problems. It was the middle school. We had two authorizations in the process. And, and every one of them, the committee, came to the board and gave their recommendation as to um, how the money should be spent because they've been doing their work along with staff, and it, it worked really well. Um, and, but, you know, we're sitting in a position now where we haven't done anything to that building in the 20 years that it's been sitting there, and I can add, you know, this was a, the most current project was what we're sitting in right now. Um, so I, I think that's going to have to happen in terms of bringing in that citizen committee. Again, there's no politicians on that because that's a dead death wish. Um, and staff is there to support the committee. I think there was 10 people on the committee, and it, it really worked out well. First of all, it took a lot of the pressure off the board when it came to that kind of decision. They made the final decision, of course, but um, this was you know, 20 years ago. So and They were different than the PAC committee? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And but then, there, in fact, I probably say that nobody on that committee was on the PAC committee. That's probably for the best. And yeah. that, sh if we were going to do that, that should have been done. Should be done right today. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, if we're, you know, if, again, it's just authorization. Um, the only one mm -hmm. that can spend that money are the five of us. But if we have this secondary committee that, um, that has the confidence, the, quite frankly, the confidence of the community. And that is established prior to the election. It doesn't have to be prior to May, to May 9th or whatever it is. Um, but okay. prior to the election, that committee is in place. That committee is not involved in the election. Uh, I mean, they're voters, certainly, but not part of the PAC. And they can determine um, 
the needs of the district, whether it's the Gordon Gordian report or whether it's something else. Um, you know, this is they do this in their business, so this isn't anything that they haven't done before, and um, they may not agree with Kane's needs today, but I think it's it's long term. It's the best solution for keeping this district operating. Does the board feel that it needs to have an, another meeting before May 9th for more information? Or will you be prepared to vote on these items at May 9th? Another meeting. Even have the dollar amount. Well, it's May 9th that the dollar amount will be decided. I'd like another meeting with the okay. dollar amount so there can be discussion around that maybe. Okay. So looking at next week. Um, uh, Wednesday night. I can't do next Wednesday night, sorry. Um, I can do uh, Tuesday the 2nd. Sunday afternoon. No. <laughs> Sunday afternoon. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks, Dana. Well, I, I work, so I can't. I'll yeah, I understand that. Um, yeah, next week I can only do Tuesday or Thursday. Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday, May 2nd? Yeah, Tuesday would work. What time? Uh, 4 o'clock, does that work for you? 4? 4. Four. 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 Yeah, do you want to check on yours, Kim? You have a um, executive 7th grade parent tour at 6.30. Well, hopefully we'll be done with that if we do it at 4. We'll just have to be because I have to be there? Yes. So, okay. I mean, I would hope for for two hours, that would be plenty. Um, okay, so Krista, could we please schedule a meeting for the board, a work study session for just the 2023 election items? Uh, if you could get some information from Steeple on a 20, uh, like a $20 million bond, $25 million bond, $30 million bond, what it looks like for 10, 15, and 20 years. Do we also want information on um, leasing the land? Uh, not the land, the uh, building or two, if we want to put something on about that? Sure, we can definitely talk about leasing the Four Peaks building. It's only one we have. Okay, so the board will have a meeting now on May 2nd at 4 o'clock. Uh, any other future action? If there is something you would like to see on agenda, please contact uh, Dr. J or Krista. Dates of upcoming meetings will be before that you, Before you go, let's make sure we're not going to talk about uh, the three parcels so that there's no confusion out there. That's not on the table for the second. Okay. And if we're putting, if we're saying leasing for peaks, wouldn't it make more sense to say lease both? No. We can't lease McDonald's. Well, we can't lease it, right. So we're talking about leasing right. versus selling. Well, because then on, we would have to put it on right. A it vote. would just be leasing, it's leasing. Uh, for peaks because if you were going to lease or sell it, that will have to right. go to an election. Because if we lease it, then we're talking about what we're doing now. And just the building, not the land. Yeah. That we would be so, leasing the building. Yeah, no, that's I, I think the same thing that, we're doing. Just to, just not to start all the discussions. Mm -hmm. We're only on the second going to talk about what? We're going to talk about and the bond and override. And the vacant buildings, mostly just and the vacant buildings. So, so are we going to be talking about the presentation that Mr. Shea did as an option, or I think that's I think we're considering we're all asked. options. Because that's what I was thinking, too. If we're going to do it, we should talk about the presentation as well. So on the second, you want to talk about the buildings, the override, and the bond that we're taking the parcels of land off the table for that meeting. Yes. 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 Everybody good with that? Yes. Okay. You got that, Krista? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> got it. Okay. Future action. We've covered dates of upcoming meetings, May 2nd, and then Tuesday, May 9th. Uh, please note that's a Tuesday meeting, not a Wednesday meeting due to senior night. Oh, um, wait a minute. What? That's not what... Uh, it said Wednesday the 9th. I think, I think 
Yes. So, is it Wednesday? It's, it's Tuesday, May 9th. Mm. Because senior night is always Wednesday. Okay. For like the last 10 years. Well, I, I get it. I just wasn't putting two to two together. Yeah. So, that yeah, could so be I problematic for me, but I'll have to work something. Okay. Because, yeah, that will. That yeah, I, I I knew he did, but um, I was thinking it was the it was the date that was wrong, not the day. Oh, no, it's mm -hmm. the day. So it is yeah. Tuesday. Tuesday, May 9th, Yes, and then after that, we won't have another meeting, maybe until Wednesday, <laughs> June seventh. <laughs> and there'll be no additional meetings added to June other than what's already on the calendar. Right. Correct. There shouldn't be because okay. additional meetings would typically be July based on the budget. Thank you. But we may have some approvals we may need to do for consolidation, so I just want to be clear about that. Sure. Are you gone? I'm working on being gone, <laughs> but I can. You want to take a vacation? You can always right? call in. I can call in for it. Okay. And those would be short. My kids would like one. <laughs> Very <Absolutely>. much. Don't we all? I move that we adjourn. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> 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 <laughs>